Joy in the city. Joy in your life. Joy in your family. And joy everywhere in Jesus' name. GCK Authority has announced the next level move. From the land of honor and integrity comes two in one GCK live in Ekiti State, Southwest Nigeria, the Global Crusade and Retreat, December 22 to 27, 2022. A new level of Impact Academy for Youth, Young Adults and Professionals, titled Recharge to Excel, December 27, 2022, at 0600 hours GMT, all broadcasts live on satellite, radio, television, and all our social media platforms with Jonathan White, our guest music minister. GCK, the gospel to every creature. Let us pray. Our God and our Father, we do bless your name for bringing us to the Bible study tonight. We pray that you make your will, your mind, known to every one of us, as we look at this passage of study tonight in Jesus' name, and as we know your mind, give us the grace to follow through, be obedient to you, and live lives that are pleasing to you in the name of the Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. We're still making progress in our study of the epistle of Paul the Apostle to the Colossians. We've been in chapter 1, and we've looked at the prayer of Paul the Apostle. In Colossians chapter 1, I'm reading to you from verse 9. For this cause we also since the day we had it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power, unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father, which has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who has delivered us from the power of darkness, and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. In those verses I've read to you, we have the prayer of Paul the Apostle to the believers, for the believers at Colossae. He prayed, in the prayer we can see two definite parts. The first part is a petition. The second part is the praise. And as this prayer consists of petition and praise, so our prayers, to be consisting of petition and praise all the time. We have already studied the petition part of the prayer. We now come to the praise aspect of the prayer. This pattern of petition and praise provides a model for our praying. And this is what you will find all through the scriptures as you study. You will find that in prayer there is both petition and praise. And there should be a balance between our asking and thanksgiving. Look at about two examples in the, Old, in the New Testament. Philippians chapter 4 and in verse 6. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known unto God. Here in the passage in Philippians, we are told that we ought to pray. And what should be the prayer? Supplication with thanksgiving. Asking on the one hand, thanksgiving on the other hand. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1, I exhort, therefore, the first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. As Paul the Apostle talks about prayers and supplications and intercessions, he also mentions thanksgiving. And our prayer should not only be uh, just request. It should be filled with thanksgiving as well. As you look at the prayer requests coming into the church, you'll see that there's a lot of prayer requests, a lot of asking, a lot of petition, and there is not as much thanksgiving. But what we're learning in the scripture is that as we're making our requests before the Lord, 
we should also be having a heart of thanksgiving unto the Lord. We must continually give thanks to the Lord in our speech, with our songs, and in our prayers. Let's look at Psalm 69. Psalm 69, verses 30 and 31. I will praise the name of God with a song, and will magnify him with thanksgiving. This also shall please the Lord better than an ox or bullock that has horns and hooves. This tells us that the praises of the Lord will be more pleasing to God than all the sacrifices of the Old Testament. In Psalm 92, verse 1. Psalm 92, verse 1. It's a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord. If it's a good thing, let's do it. If it's a good thing, let's make a practice out of it. If, it is a, if, it, if it's a good thing, let it, there, there be a balance between a request and thanksgiving. And it is also a good thing to sing praises unto thy name, O Most High. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. In our speech, in our discussion with one another, we should be thanking the Lord all the time. We are commanded to give thanks to God. And we have examples of praising God in the scripture. And these examples show us that we are to praise the Lord both publicly and privately. Both publicly and privately. Daniel chapter 6 verse 10. Daniel chapter 6, verse 10. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house, and his windows being opened in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. Here was the time of persecution for Daniel. He prayed and praised the Lord. Here was the time of danger and difficulty for Daniel. He prayed and praised the Lord. If he could praise the Lord at a time when the writing had been signed, that anybody that prayed unto the Lord will be cast into the den of lions, how much more we should be praising the Lord every time. Our persecution will not generally rise up to the persecution of Daniel. If he could pray and praise the name of the Lord in such a terrible persecution, we also should be praying and praising the name of the Lord every time of our lives. I've shown you that privately. Daniel praised the name of the Lord. Publicly too, we are to praise the name of the Lord in Psalm 35. Psalm 35, verse 18. I will give thee thanks in the great congregation. I will praise thee among much people. I will praise thee among much people when we come into the church of the living God here and the opportunity is given to us we ought to praise the name of the Lord when we're writing prayer requests we ought also to write areas where we ought to be praising the name of the Lord for the great things and the good things that he has done in our lives through the Lord Jesus Christ we should praise his name publicly and praise him privately. What are we thanking God for? There are general things we need to thank God for. The word of God tells us we should be thanking him for who he is. Because he's faithful. Because he's holy. Because he's near to all the people that are calling upon him. Because they will never fail. Because he loves us and he cares for us. Because of who he is, we ought to be praising the name of the Lord. Number two, we ought to be praising the name of the Lord for the accomplished work of Christ on the cross of Calvary. We ought to be praising him. Number three, we ought to be praising his name for our salvation. Number four, we ought to be praising the Lord for spiritual progress in the lives of other people. Many times we only praise the Lord for what the Lord is doing in our own lives. We do not praise the Lord enough for what he is doing in the lives of other people. What the Lord is doing in the church. What the Lord is doing as we are hearing the testimonies of his greatness and goodness in the lives of others. We ought to be praising the Lord. In fact, we need to be praising the Lord in everything 
and for everything. Let's look at them one by one. We should be praising the Lord for who the Lord is in Psalm 30, verse 4. Psalm 30, verse 4. Sing unto the Lord, O ye saints of his, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holiness. You remember God is holy? You know God is faithful? You know God will never fail? You know God is of purer eyes than to behold iniquity? Praise the Lord at the remembrance of his holiness. Psalm 75, verse 1. Unto thee, O God, do we give thanks. Unto thee, do we give thanks. Why? For that thy name is near, thy wondrous works declare. Therefore, we should be praising the Lord. You see that God is very near and he answers prayer. We praise his name. You see that God is very near. He has not abandoned us in our problems. We ought to be praising the name of the Lord. You praise the Lord because of who he is. Number two, you praise the Lord because of the accomplished work of Christ on the cross of Calvary. When you remember what Christ has done, it should bring the praise of the Lord out of your heart through your lips unto God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Verse 57. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us. He defeated the devil on the cross for us. He brought an end to the reign of sin in our lives. And he suffered the punishment we should have suffered. You praise the Lord because of the accomplished work of Christ on the cross of Calvary. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. Now, thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ, and maketh manifest the savour of his knowledge by us, in every place. Chapter 9, verse 15. 2 Corinthians 9, 15. Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable, immeasurable gift. Because of what Christ has done, because everything we have spiritually must go back, must have a foundation and basis on the cross of Jesus Christ, must have its foundation and basis on the suffering that Jesus suffered for us and the shedding of his blood, because of that, we need to be praising the Lord, not only for the general thing that Christ has done on the cross of Calvary, but because we are partakers of that thing he did on the cross of Calvary, because of our salvation, because we have got eternal life, because we are children of God. We need to be praising the name of the Lord in 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1, from verse 12. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has enabled me for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying, and worthy of all acceptation. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Paul the Apostle never lost sight of the fact that he was a sinner. The grace of God came upon his life, and the Lord forgave him and had mercy upon him. And because of that salvation, he was giving thanks to the Lord every time. And we ought to be giving thanks to the Lord for our salvation every time. But something we find in the life of Paul the Apostle is that he did not only praise God for his own salvation, he praised the Lord for the salvation of other people. Anytime he heard that other people had the door of salvation open up to them, anytime he heard that other people had received faith and they had believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and they were now children of God, he will be praising God for them. He praised God for the spiritual progress in the lives of other people. In Romans chapter 1 verse 8, Romans chapter 1, verse 8. For I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all. For that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. He said, I hear of your spiritual progress. I hear of the effect of your testimony. I hear of the outcome of your coming into the kingdom of God. And your faith is spoken about throughout the whole world. And I praise the Lord for that. 
You see, some people can only praise the Lord for what they receive personally. But Paul the Apostle will praise the Lord for what other people are receiving and for what progress they are making in the things of the Lord. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing. You see, Paul the Apostle, he did not only pray, he praised the Lord. And here he was praising the Lord for what had happened to other people. For this cause also, thank we God without ceasing. Because when you receive the word of God, which he had of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. He followed them up. He knew that the power of God was working in their lives. He knew that they were making spiritual progress. And there was one thing he did about that. He praised the name of the Lord for their spiritual progress. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3, We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because that your faith groweth exceedingly. They had spiritual progress. Their faith was growing exceedingly. And a charity of every one of you toward all, each toward uh, all, each other abounded. He praised the name of the Lord because the love they had for one another was growing exceedingly. Because of this, he praised the Lord. In fact, we are to praise the name of the Lord for everything. Look at Second Corinthians chapter 9, verse 11. Second Corinthians chapter 9, verse 11. Being enriched in everything to all bountifulness, which causes through us thanksgiving to God. Being enriched in everything, whatever we have, spiritual things, material things, opportunities, materially, physically, or in the church, we ought to be praising the name of the Lord. In everything, we should be thanking the name of the Lord. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18, in everything. Give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. So, broadly spoken about, we're praising the name of the Lord for who God is. We're praising the name of the Lord for the accomplished work of Christ on the cross of Calvary. We're praising the name of the Lord for our own salvation. And we're praising the name of the Lord for the spiritual progress in the lives of other people. We're praising the Lord because of everything. But in Colossians chapter 1 that we're studying today, Paul the Apostle mentions some definite things that he was thanking the Lord for. And things we ought to be thanking the name of the Lord for. He spoke about four definite things that they needed to thank God for, which he had been thanking God for on their behalf. Colossians chapter 1 from verse 12. Giving thanks unto the Father which has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. That's the first thing. Number two, verse 13, who has delivered us from the power of darkness. He was thanking God for that. Number three, and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. He was full of praises because of that. Number four, in verse 14, in whom we have redemption through his blood. Even the forgiveness of sins. He said, we ought to be thanking God. And he had been thanking God. Why? Number one, because of our inheritance. Number two, because of our deliverance. Number three, because of our transparency. Number four, because of our redemption. Let's look at them one by one. We praise the name of the Lord because of our inheritance. Look at it again. Colossians chapter 1, verse 12. We're giving thanks unto the Father which has made us meet to be partakers of, his, of the inheritance of the saints in light. Why will Paul the Apostle praise God for such a thing as this? He praised the name of the Lord because of this thing, because it was a mystery. A mystery that the Old Testament people never knew anything about. That the Gentiles, that the Colossians, and all other Gentiles in the world should be made meet should be made fit to become partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. That the Gentiles should inherit anything like this, any goodness of the Lord like this, it was a mystery. 
It was something great. It was something so marvelous that Paul the Apostle could not overlook it and he praised the name of the Lord. Why was it a mystery? Look at Ephesians chapter 2, reading from verse 1. And you are sea quaking, who were dead in trespasses and sins. The very fact that these people were dead in trespasses and sins before. The very fact that these people were Gentiles before. They were alienated from the life of God before. And now God has done something. God has given us a suspicable gift that now we can be made partakers of the inheritance of the saints in life. It was a marvelous great thing we needed to thank the Lord for. In verse 2, wherein in time past, he walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now walketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had a conversation in times past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Paul the Apostle said, don't you remember the pit out of which we were dug out? Paul the Apostle said, don't you remember who we were? Don't you remember we were children of wrath, and we should have inherited the punishment and indignation, the wrath of God, even the children of disobedience that we were, even as other people. But now, how we need to praise the name of the Lord, because he has made us meet. He has made us fit and suitable to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in life. Why will Paul the Apostle uh, magnify this and praise the name of the Lord for it? Look at Ephesians again, chapter 2, verse 12. That at that time, ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. That's why now he said, see where God has brought you. Because before you knew the Lord, you were Christless without Christ. Before you knew the Lord, you were stateless, aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. Before you knew the Lord, you were covenantless. You were aliens and strangers from the covenant of promise. Before you knew the Lord, you were hopeless without hope having no hope. And before you knew the Lord, you were godless without God in the world. That's why he said, see what God has done. See Christ done on the cross of Calvary. And he has taken people that were Christless and stateless and covenantless and hopeless and godless. And he has made you to be meet, to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in life. He said, because of that, you ought to be praising the name of the Lord in Ephesians chapter 4. And in verse 17, this I say therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God, through the ignorance that was that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling, have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to walk, all uncleanness and greediness. Here he was saying, this is what you were. This is what I was. This is what all the Colossians were. They were people that were so lascivious. They were people that were given to self and to the flesh and to ignorance and darkness and the blindness of the heart. They were people that walked all covetousness and evil things, all, un all uncleanness with greediness, and they were past feeling. They lost sensitivity to the things that were right or the things that were good. He said, you will never have been partakers with the saints of God, with the children of God. But now, he has made you partakers of the inheritance of the saints in life. Come back to Colossians chapter 1, verse 12. Look at something here. Giving thanks unto the Father, which has made us meet. If we were hopeless, if we were godless, if we were covenantless, and he had no covenant with the Gentiles, he had no covenant with us, he only had covenant with the commonwealth of Israel. If we were covenantless and were hopeless and godless and Christless and stateless, what did he do so that we can be made meet of the, to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints with life? We have to go back to Ephesians again, chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love, wherewith he loved us, 
even when we were dead in sins, has quickened us together with Christ. By grace are ye saved. He said it is all of grace, not of works, lest any man should boast. He said we will never be good enough. We will never have refined ourselves or polished ourselves or done anything in our lives that will merit to become partakers of the inheritance of the, of the saints in life. And you know when a man wants to write his will and he wants to bequeath or he wants to give inheritance to people, he gives inheritance to those who are related to him. He gives inheritance to those who are his children. He doesn't give inheritance to an enemy. What were we? Or are enemies of God? Oh, no wonder. That Paul said, giving thanks to the Father, who has made us me to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in life. He said, we were enemies. No man will ever give an inheritance, write a will and give an inheritance to the enemies. But that's what God has done for us, because we are reconciled through the Lord Jesus Christ. And what were we? We were strangers. No man will write a will and give an inheritance to a stranger, and yet we were strangers. But by grace are ye saved, because we have been saved by the grace of God, and we are no more strangers. He has given us an inheritance in verse 7 of Ephesians chapter 2, that in ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. That's how he made us meet. That's how he made us suitable to become partakers of the inheritance of saints in life. And then he says, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Because we're children of God now, because we're no more enemies, because we're no more far away, because we're no more strangers, he has now given us inheritance among the saints of God who are walking in the light. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 26, Acts of the Apostles, chapter 26, verse 18, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that ye may receive forgiveness of sin and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. If you remember what we were studying in Colossians chapter 1, verse 12, he has made us meet to be partakers of his inheritance of the saints walking in the light, the saints in life. And here he says, he has given us inheritance among them which are sanctified through their faith in Christ. In Romans chapter 8, verses 16 and 17. Romans chapter 8, verses 16 and 17. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. No more enemies. When we confessed our sins, when we cried unto the Lord, when we repented and turned away from sin, when we pleaded for mercy, then the Spirit of God came to say, you are no more a stranger, you are now a child. You are no more an enemy, you are now a child. You are no more far away, you are brought near. You are no more at enmity, but you are now at peace with God because you are justified by faith in Christ. Because the Spirit of God is not bearing witness in our spirit that we are the children of God. Now that we are children, what are we going to have? Inheritance. Verse 17. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God. And joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. In First Peter chapter 1. First Peter chapter 1 from verse 3. Blessed be God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy, not according to our merit, his, his abundant mercy, has begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Remember that we had no hope, but now we are begotten again unto a lively hope. How? What did God use to do that? Because of the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ on our behalf. And now we are begotten again unto an inheritance, verse 4, incorruptible and undefiled, that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So then, 
we can see that we have inheritance with the Lord. And it is as we read the Word of God, as we study the Word of God, that we come to know, we come to understand our inheritance. If you don't study the Word of God, you'll be ignorant of the inheritance that you have in Christ Jesus. Let's look at Acts chapter 20, verse 32. Acts chapter 20, verse 32. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace. We need that word. Because it is that word that will make us to have the assurance of our inheritance. And to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. As we're talking about this inheritance, remember that the inheritance are, is for the saints, the saints of God. Who are the saints of God? Those who have been uh, born again. And those who are walking in the light. Because the unbelievers, the sinners, have no inheritance in the kingdom of God. First Corinthians chapter 6, from verse 9. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Why? The unrighteous is a stranger to God. And the stranger who is not a child of God cannot inherit. And this uh, unrighteous person, being a stranger and being, uh, being an enemy, is also a person that is far away. He has no relationship with the Lord. Therefore, he cannot inherit anything from the Lord. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor the effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. As you examine these and you see that you are still like this, you have not been born again, then you are missing a lot because you are missing inheritance of the saints in life. No thieves, no covetous, no drunkards, no revilers, no extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. But you say, how will I have a change? How will I have a complete change that I will now inherit something from the Lord, inherit eternal life? Look at verse 11, such were some of you, but now ye are washed, but now ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus, and by the Spirit of our God, if you will turn away from sin, and if you will be washed in the blood of the Lamb, then you will come to inherit among the saints of God. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 12, giving thanks unto the Father, which has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints. Sinners have no inheritance. Enemies have no inheritance. Those who are fighting the gospel and fighting the word of God and fighting the revelation of the truth in Christ, they have no inheritance. But those who are saints in light, when we talk about light, we're talking about truth. When we talk about light, we're talking about righteousness, holiness, and purity. And that is how you know the saints. The saints are the people that are not walking in error. They are walking in the light of the truth. The saints are people that are not living dirty lives. They are living in the light of the word of God. They are living pure lives, holy lives, righteous lives. And those are the people that will inherit. What are they going to inherit? Number one, we inherit eternal life. Number two, we inherit all the promises. Think about all the promises of God. From the Old Testament to the New Testament, we inherit all the promises. Look at Hebrews chapter 6, verse 12. That ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. That's what we inherit. We inherit the promises. Not only that, we inherit all things. All things, literally. God says, I make all things new. And he that overcometh shall inherit all things. So Paul the Apostle said, because of this mystery, because those of us who are enemies of righteousness, enemies of the gospel, enemies of God, enemies of Christ, we have been changed. And we have been made partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. We need to praise the name of God. Now number two, we need to praise the name of the Lord because of our deliverance. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 13, Who has delivered us from the power of darkness? Who has delivered us from the power of darkness? From the time of the fall of Adam, humanity came under the power of the devil. And we could not deliver ourselves from the power of darkness. 
from the power of the devil. He took Jesus Christ, the greater one. He took Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, to come to die for us on the cross of Calvary and deal a deadly blow on the head of the devil because of the promise that we have in Genesis chapter 3. Look at it. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Because of this promise, Jesus eventually came and he was the only one that could have delivered us from the power of darkness. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman. Between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. When the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross bruised the head of the devil, then he delivered us from the power of darkness. No child of, the, of Adam, no offspring of Adam could have delivered himself from the power of darkness, from the power of the terrible one, except God himself, who has sent the Lord Jesus Christ to deliver us. Look at Jeremiah chapter 31. Jeremiah chapter 31. Reading from verse 11. For the Lord has redeemed Jacob and has ransomed him from, from the hand of him that was stronger than he. Satan was stronger than every human being. And no human being could have delivered himself out of the power of darkness. But Jesus Christ came. And because he came, he delivered us from the power of darkness. Jeremiah chapter 15 verse 21. Jeremiah 15 21. And I will deliver thee out of the hand of the wicked. And will redeem thee out of the hand of the terrible. Satan is that terrible one. And no man could have delivered himself. But Christ came and he delivered us. And because of this privilege of deliverance, Paul the Apostle said, we need to give thanks to the name of the Lord. Who would have imagined that humanity will be delivered out of the hand of the devil, will be delivered from the power of darkness? What could have delivered us except that Christ died on the cross of Calvary? Because of this, we need to be thankful and grateful unto the Lord. Let's look at Isaiah chapter 49. Isaiah chapter 49, verses 24 and 25. Shall the prey be taken from the mighty? And the lawful captive delivered? The question from the prophet is this. How is it possible? And will it ever be possible that the prey, that the subject, the captive, will be taken away from the hand of the mighty? And that the lawful captive will ever be delivered? Here is the answer of the Lord in verse 25. But thus says the Lord, Even the captives of the mighty shall be taken away, and the prey of the terrible shall be delivered. For I will contend with him that contendeth with thee, and I will save thy children. It was when Christ died on the cross of Calvary that this was made possible. And Isaiah knew it. Isaiah knew that only the Messiah will have to come and deliver us from the hand of the terrible one. Because he said in Isaiah chapter 53 from verse 11, He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many and he shall bear their iniquities. You see that? Jesus Christ came and he delivered us from the power of the mighty. And he suffered, you need to know this, he suffered from the power of darkness. And the reason he suffered from that power of darkness is so that we will be delivered from the power of darkness. Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22, verses 52 and 53. Then Jesus says unto the chief priests and the captains of the temple and the elders which were come to him, be ye come out as against the thief with swords and staves. When I was daily with you in the temple, ye stretched forth no hand against me. Notice what follows. But this is your hour and the power of darkness. All the power of darkness came against him, sent him to the cross, and he bled and died on the cross. As the result of all the power of darkness fighting against him, and he dealing a deadly blow on the powers of darkness on the cross of Calvary. 
And he said, it is finished. By that sacrifice are we delivered from the power of darkness. Because he faced the challenge. He fought the fight. And he overcame the devil. And now he has delivered us from him that has the power of death. Because of that, Paul the apostle said, the whole church shall arise and praise the name of the Lord. And he led the, led the band and he started praising the name of the Lord. In Hebrews chapter 2, Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. For as much then, as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them, who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. You see many people in the world, because they know they cannot be delivered from the power of darkness. What they do is that they try to make covenant with the power of darkness. They, they try to get initiated into a secret cult, a society, so that maybe they will have protection. But it says, we who are children of God, Christ has paid the price. Christ has suffered. And he has destroyed him that has the power of death, that is the devil, so that we now can be totally delivered. Many people are fearing death. They are walking every day. They are fearing death. When they go out, when they come in, they are afraid of death. In darkness, they are afraid of death. They are afraid of the power of darkness. But we praise the name of the Lord because we are delivered. Because we are delivered, there is no fear in our hearts anymore. Even death is defeated on our behalf. The devil is defeated on our behalf. All the powers of darkness, they are, de they are defeated on our behalf. No wonder the apostle began to praise the name of the Lord. And he said, there, he said, Thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We are given the victory. And I pray we will continue to enjoy our victory in Jesus' name. Do you know now that even the devil is subject unto us, is under our feet. Look at Romans chapter 16 and in verse 20. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. Praise the Lord. You see, that's our deliverance. We are delivered. Therefore, we are not under the power of Satan anymore. That's why believers don't fear witches and wizards. Because that's part of the power of darkness. And we have been delivered. That is why we don't fear the power of secret cults anymore. When you come out of a secret society, when you come out of a cult, and you come under the banner of the blood of Jesus Christ, you have nothing to fear. You know why? You have been delivered from the power of darkness. That's why we do not fear all the principalities and powers, all the familiar spirits and the soothsayers, and all the magicians and all the palm readers. You know why? We are delivered from the power of darkness. That's why we don't fear any Habalists or Juju people. You know why? We are delivered from the power of darkness. Now, many people do not enjoy that deliverance because they do not stand on their right. They do not claim their right. They do not move on in victory in their right. And they are not praising God all the time because of their deliverance. But by the grace of God, I pray and I believe you will begin to enjoy your deliverance and your privilege more than ever before from now on in Jesus' name. Colossians chapter 1. Now another thing we need to praise the name of the Lord for is that we have been transferred. We have been transferred or translated from the kingdom of darkness unto the kingdom of his dear son. Look at it in Colossians chapter 1, verse 13. Who has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Our transference. We have been transferred. It is just like the children of Israel were taken away from Egypt who were brought to the land of Canaan. And God said about them, he said, how I bear you up on the wings of eagles. They were translated. They were taken away from one position and taken to another position. And he said, because of that, we ought to be praising the name of the Lord. In our own case, we have been taken away from bondage. We have been brought into the liberty and the freedom of the children of God. 
We have been taken away from death and the dominion of death. We have been taken into the dominion of life eternal. We have been taken away from darkness and we have been brought into the light. We are taken away from the wilderness and we are brought into the promised land. Because we have been translated from darkness to light, from death to life. From the wilderness to the mansion and to the home to the palace of the Father. From the power of Satan to the power of God. Because of that translation and that transparency, we need to praise the name of the Lord. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and in verse 12. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 12. That ye walk worthy of God who has called you unto his kingdom and glory. But no more in Egypt. We're now in the land of Canaan. We're no more in the wilderness. We're now in the presence of the Father. We have been called out of the world and we have been called into the kingdom of his dear son. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, 2 Corinthians, uh, rather chapter 6, chapter 6 from verse 17. That is why it has now become our responsibility to live like people who have been called out of the world Live like people who have been transferred out of the wilderness. Live like people who have been translated out of Egypt and out of darkness into the light. Second Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17. Wherefore, come out from among them. Wherefore, come out from among the adulterers. You don't belong there again. Wherefore, come out from the prostitutes. You don't belong there again. Wherefore, come out from the covetous. You don't belong there again. Don't you know you have been translated? Live to your privilege. Live to your position. Wherefore, come out from the enemies of the gospel who are fighting the doctrine of the Bible. You are no more an enemy if you have been born again. You are no more supposed to be arguing against doctrine. Don't you know that that is a characteristic of the people that don't know God? Come out from among the argumentators because you don't belong there. You are now a child of God. You have been translated out of the kingdom of darkness unto the kingdom of his dear son. Wherefore, come out of among the covetous because now contentment is the rule of your life because God will supply all your need according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. You are not in the wilderness. You are not a slave. You are not a captive in Egypt. But you are a real child of God. And since God will supply all your need, why are you still over there among the covetous people? Come out from among them. And be ye separate, says the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing. And I will receive you and will be a father unto you. And ye shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Let us look at First Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, reading from verse 9. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people that ye should show forth the praises of him who has called you out. He has translated you. He has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but now ye are the people of God which have not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims as same from fleshly laws, which war against the soul. Now we are children of God. Now we have been translated, and we are now in the kingdom of God. Because we are now in the kingdom of God, and we ought to live righteous lives according to our privileges in the kingdom of God. Because of that, Paul the Apostle said, I've been praising the Lord. Because God took you people that were not a people before. You are now the people of God. People that had no name on earth. And of course had no name written in heaven. But now your names are written in the book of life in heaven. People that should have gone to even the prison of this world. But now you are set at liberty and you are children of God. People that were enemies of righteousness far away from the Lord before. But now you are brought to sit in the very presence of God. People that were just in the wilderness, in a place where there was no blessing. But now the rain of blessing of God is falling upon you every time. Because you are now in the kingdom of his dear son. He said for that mystery of the gospel. Calling the Gentile into the very presence and provision of the Lord. There's only one thing we need to do. We need to be thanking and praising the name of the Lord for that. In Colossians chapter 1, reading from verse 14. In whom... Ye have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. 
And it tells us another thing. You see, in the Old Testament, people were sin conscious. You see, in the Old Testament, no matter what sacrifices they brought on the Day of Atonement, the following year again, they were going to bring another sacrifice. And if you notice, you will see that even the high priest will, will first of all make sacrifice for his own sin. And then for the sins of the people. Those people were sin conscious every time. Every time they came to the presence of God in the Old Testament, the very first thing they would do was to confess sin. Even when you look at some good people of the Old Testament like Nehemiah, when he came to the presence of God, you know what he did? He had to confess sin. The sin of the people, the sin of the fathers, the sin of the nation, the sin of everybody and his own. Even a good man like Daniel, when you read Daniel chapter 9, you see what he did? He said, we are sinned. He said, because of our sins. He said, we do not have any face to face you because we are ashamed and we blush because of our sin. But then, when, as the New Testament has come now, we are redeemed and we are forgiven. And we are cleansed in the blood of Jesus Christ. And the consciousness of sin is taken away. When you read the prayers of the New Testament from Acts of the Apostles on, when you read the prayers in Acts chapter 4, there is no confession of sin. When you read the prayers of the church in Acts chapter 12, there is no confession of sin. When you read the prayer of Paul the Apostle for the Romans, for the Christians at Rome, in Romans chapter 1, there is no sin consciousness there. When you read the prayers of Paul the Apostle for the Ephesians, in Ephesians chapter 1, there is no confession of sins. When you read the prayers of Paul in Colossians chapter 1, there is no confession of sin. Why? Because the blood of Jesus Christ has cleansed everything. He said, you people at Colossae, you should be thanking God for something. If you were living in the Old Testament, every Sabbath day, you'll be making a confession. That's what some people are still doing today. Every Saturday, they go and kneel down before somebody or before something, they'll begin to confess sin. That is what some people are still doing every Sunday. Every Sunday they go to their church building and what they do first is to be confessing sin. That's what some people are doing every day when they have quiet time. They don't know the privilege of the children of God. They do not know the privilege of those who are really born again. They are still confessing sin every time. But Paul the Apostle said, we need to be thanking God for something in whom we have redemption through his blood. Even the forgiveness of sin. He said, we've got it. We're not trying to get it. We have got it. He said, we are now conscious of the peace of God, not of sin. We are now conscious of righteousness, not of sin. We are now conscious of our redemption. We are not conscious of sin. We are now conscious of the victory we have in Christ, not of sin. In whom we have redemption through his blood. Even the forgiveness of sin. Look at Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. That's why believers are not confessing sin every day. They are not confessing sin every Sunday. They are not confessing sin every Easter. They are not confessing sin every Christmas. They are not confessing sin every camp meeting. They are not confessing sin every retreat. They are not confessing sin every time because they have been redeemed. They have been justified. Their sins have been taken away. In Romans chapter 8, verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to them that which are in Christ Jesus, which walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Now we are free as children of God. If you are not free from sin, then it means that you are not a child of God yet. It means that you are not full of the presence of God yet for redemption and for forgiveness of sin. Because that sin that you call sin should be a past sin in your life. In Romans chapter 6, Romans chapter 6, verse 11, Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the loss thereof. Neither yield your members as instrument of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourself unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. 
For sin shall not have dominion over you. For sin shall not have dominion over you. For ye are not under the law, but under grace. In verse, verse 17. But God be thanked. That's why we are praising God. But God be thanked. We are praising God for our redemption. We are praising God for the forgiveness we are enjoying. We are praising God for the victory we have got. Victory and we are set free at liberty from sin. But God be thanked that ye were servants of sin in the past. But now ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which is delivered unto you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. Ye became the servants of righteousness. First John chapter 3. First John chapter 3. Verses 8 and 9. He that committeth sin is of the devil. Sometimes you'll find a pastor in a church that will say he is still committing sin every day. Well, the Bible says then it's of the devil. Sometimes you'll find an evangelist that will stand up and publicly tell people and say, nobody can ever be free from sin. He, the evangelist, is still committing sin every day. Then the Bible says he is of the devil. Sometimes you'll find a deacon in a church that will stand up and say, well, he's still committing sin. He will never be free from sin. The Bible says he is of the devil. Sometimes you'll find a worker that will say, well, I don't pretend to be holy. I don't pretend to be perfect. I'm still sinning every day. Then that person is still of the devil. He that committed sin is of the devil. For the devil sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy, praise the Lord. That he might destroy the works of the devil. You see the glory of, the beauty of what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary for this purpose. Christ, the Son of God, was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. If you have not got that experience, pray for it. If you have not got that experience, seek the face of the Lord for it. If you have not got that experience, get down on your knees, get down your face before the Lord and say, Lord, if I don't have this, what else do I have? If you don't have victory over sin, what are you enjoying of what Christ did on the cross of Calvary? This is a very blessing flowing, flowing from Calvary that is flowing as a result of the shedding of the blood of Jesus Christ. He gives us victory over sin. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. A person that is really a child of God is not getting angry every day, fighting every day, being covetous every day, having a immorality in the heart every day, touching women and having immorality in the mind or even doing it every day, having pornography and all these evil things and still committing sin and is stealing and is covetous and is still saying, well, I am born again. No, no, no. When you are born again, you will not continue in sin. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him. Something from heaven will get into your soul will get into your heart. The very nature of God, the very part of the life of God will come into you. His seed remaineth in him and he cannot sin. Oh, praise the Lord. He cannot sin. Temptation will come, he cannot sin. The devil will tempt him, he cannot sin. The devil will tease him, he cannot sin. Women will try to show some picture to them, he cannot sin. And the people will try to lure them and entice them, but he cannot sin because he is born of God. In this, the children of God are manifest. That's how we know the children of God. That's how we know those who are born again. That's how we know those who have got this mysterious thing we call salvation, eternal life with the Lord. In this, the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. In Colossians chapter 1. Paul the Apostle has been talking to us and he has said, we need to praise the name of the Lord. What are we praising the name of the Lord for? Generally, we need to praise the name of the Lord for who he is. We need to praise the name of the Lord for the accomplished work of Christ on the cross of Calvary. We need to praise the name of the Lord for our salvation. We need to praise the Lord because of the progress spiritually that other people are making because of the testimonies in their lives and from their lives. We need to praise the name of the Lord for everything, but in particular, from what we have seen today. We need to praise the name of the Lord for our inheritance, for our deliverance, for our transparency, and for our redemption in the Lord. 
and for the fact that he gives us the victory and he makes us free. Let us rise up and praise the name of the Lord because of what he has done for us on the cross of Calvary. Because of what he has accomplished for us on the cross of Calvary. Let us arise and praise the name of the Lord for our inheritance, for our deliverance, for our transparency, and for our redemption. Praise his name. Praise his name. If you are born again, you have something to praise the name of the Lord for. If you have known what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary, you have something to praise the name of the Lord for. Praise his name. Praise his name. For our inheritance in heaven that fadeth not away and that cannot be corruptible. For our deliverance, for our transference, we are transferred from darkness unto light, from death unto life. Praise his name. For our redemption, for the forgiveness he has given unto us and for the victory over sin, over the flesh, over temptation, over the enemy, over the devil, for the victory and the dominion that Christ has given unto us. Praise the name of the Lord. 